This is coverage of the Dairy Commodity Meeting of the NFO National Convention in Denver, Colorado. And now we go to the platform of the Dairy Commodity Meeting. And I didn't come right out of law school. I was born and raised on a dairy farm in New Jersey. So I milked cows and I milked them by hand. I'm as manager of a cooperative. And there I had like 50 trucks going out at 5 o'clock every morning. I had five or six or eight relief drivers, four or five supervisors, but when they didn't, drivers didn't show up, and the relief drivers were used up, and the supervisors were used up, I got a call at 5.30, come drive the milk truck, okay? So then what I do, I hire another relief driver, you know, because I don't like to drive milk truck, but I've driven my share. Then I've had drivers, you know, they run them in the ditch, they steal your money. I say, there must be an easier way to make a living in this dairy business. I've been in it all my life. I milk cows, I run a processing plant, it's still headaches. So I went to law school. So I spent four years in law school. Where do I end up? Beatrice Food, Chicago, Illinois, in the law department. And what do I get assigned? Dairy. So I never got out of it. And I spent 10 years with Beatrice Foods in Chicago, representing them against you and lawsuits, negotiations, and everything else for 10 years. But I like a challenge, and I got stereotyped. You know, these corporations, they put you in one little corner, and they say, this is your job, okay? Don't look over here at what this guy's doing. This is your job. I don't like that. So I wanted a challenge. I wasn't really looking for one. But Ed Groff called me one day and said, how would you like to come to work for the National Farmers Organization? I said, you're kidding. He said, no, I'm serious. I said, geez, I'll have to think that one over for a while, you know. <laughs> oh. And I thought about it, and I made some contacts with friends I've got in government, milk market administrators and say, hey, what's this NFO doing? You know, they still a bunch of yo-yos they used to be. And they said, no, you know, they're, they're getting a little better, you know? And I was looking for a challenge, so I said, Ed, you got your man. No, I didn't say that right away. I came down to the corner in Iowa. And I looked around there and I said, oh, what am I getting into here? <laughs> I left a plush office in Chicago, Illinois, walk into Corning, Iowa, and look at that office. We had about 12 people in one big room all talking on the telephone, trying to out-shout one another at the same time. I look around and say, oh, I don't know about this one. So they let me think about it a little bit, you know. But the challenge was there. And I didn't realize how great the challenge was. And it was a great challenge, and it still is today. And I started there in April of 1978. And this organization has improved. And I'm not an old timer. I'm a neophyte, a newborn to this organization. But in my tenure with this organization, I've seen it grow, management improve, become fiscally responsible. And we started something in Derry five years ago that was unheard of in NFO. That's decentralized management. I was brought up under that concept. Because milk is a perishable commodity. If you don't move it, if you don't sell it, it rots, okay? 
So we got the best marketing program in the organization. We don't have to space it out. We know we got to move it every day or rot. We can't store it like you can grain. We can't keep the cows and let them fatten up a little longer for another month. It'll rot. So we started decentralized management. When I came in the organization, I had about 14 people on the dairy staff. I nicknamed them my voluntary fire department because every time the phone rang, they put on their red helmets, grabbed their axe, and ran for the phone to put out the fire. Nobody knew where the fire was. And we worked around that, and now you see 50% of the dairy department. Okay? The only one that's not here is Al Scott, who's at, at, at attend another meeting, and Wayne Moore, who's running our booth. But uh, we cut our staff down, and we put the responsibility out into the field. And it's worked well. We recognized, and that's the first thing you have to do, is recognize you've got a problem. You know, a lot of people don't recognize you've got a problem. We recognized we had a problem. So we sat down and said, what's the problem? We're being outsold in the field. Mid-Amp, Ampi, Agrimark, who have you. They're outselling us. So once you recognize your problem, then you sit down and you say, what do we do about it? We pinpointed the problem, what do we do about it? So we started, what was it, Ted? Training program, 79, year after. It took us a year to think the problem out. In 1979, we started a dairy training program for our staff. This has been very successful. We have not stuck exactly with the same program because times change and we update it and we get better. And many members and county leaders have participated in these programs. And as Al Scott told you yesterday, we're going to be available to hold these training sessions in areas. Because the success of this organization has always been the members. And the more membership participation, the more success. And we've upgraded our programs. And I'll take our dairy staff today that we've got in the National Farmers Organization, and I'll stack them up against any in this United States, bar none. But we're still not satisfied. I'm going to steal Ted's statement because it's mine, and he used it at the last meeting. We're gratified, but not satisfied. Because we have made growth. we made constant growth over the last five years. And we cut black figures because the only one I know that can run a deficit budget and stay in business is the federal government. And that's because they got the power to tax. I know I can't run personally a deficit budget and no corporation I could ever work for ever ran a deficit budget because they go broke and down the tube. And we're not going to run a deficit budget in this organization because we're going to be fiscally responsible. And that's the keynote to it. We know what we have to do, but we're going to put the production on to do it. You say, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? We're doing both. We got the chicken, we're laying the egg at the same time. And in the next five years, the past five years are nothing compared to what the next five years are going to be.
because we are growing. We're not going to move farmers by mass emotional meetings. It's eyeball to eyeball contact right down the road. And that's the way this organization is going to grow. And we can only afford so many staff people to assist you because it's your organization. And the success of this organization and the success of the dairy program is going to depend on you people sitting out here. We will give you all the assistance, but if I can have one staff member and 30 or 40 members, look how it multiplies. That's what we've got to do is multiply. And we've got to get back to the county organizations, the county structures, where they've got an obligation. And we'll work with them to achieve those goals and obligations. But I'm telling you, your staff cannot do it all. We're going to do the most we can. And we will show growth doing it ourselves. But we're not going to get the job done doing it ourselves. We're not going to get the job done without member participation. And talking about member participation, we had a very successful drive in which we tried this, and it was very successful, by taking farmers, farmer to farmer, from throughout the United States, and sending them into Minnesota and Wisconsin with the objective of raising the Minnesota-Wisconsin price series. Now, I'm an attorney, and I wouldn't make this statement if I was standing on Wisconsin soil because we have an injunction against us in Wisconsin by an old friend of ours called Judge Murphy in Fond du Lac County. And he probably put me in jail for making that statement in Wisconsin. But in Denver, Colorado, I can make the statement, and it's just as true in Wisconsin as it is Denver, Colorado. We can do it. And Ted Strait's going to tell you about it. Ted? By the way, he's our national director of training, procurement, Area Director for Illinois, Missouri, Kansas, and anything else that comes around. Empty and trash cans. <laughs> Head gopher. Good morning. Thank you. Like Ted was stating before, we started out in 78. We had a little situation in front of us as a decline in the dairy production going through the National Farmers Organization. We did develop a training program because Al Scott said we do have the best program in the world, and that's very evident, isn't it? I mean, there is no program, any program anywhere in the United States or the country, as far as that goes, that compares to the National Farmers Organization. The problem we had was getting people to understand it. So simply, like he said, we were getting outsold. We did develop a training program, and through the years, we have developed our staff to some of the top staff in the country. The people have the ability to go out and communicate with people to get the message across of what NFO is and what they are doing, and it has helped. Now, we have also set up not only in-class sessions, but we've put team drives together, and I'm talking with staff. We put these team drives together, they go out on the road, they work, they come in each night, and we evaluate the contacts, what they've done. Did they do it properly? The ones that come in with success, they evidently did. And we awarded them a little bit. I might give them a $5 bill, but then there's some of them that come in with nothing at all. We might give them a little bottle of band deodorant or breath mint or something like this but it give them incentive. They worked with it, they've worked hard, and they've developed herself real well. And between that and the member participation out here, we not only turned the loss around, but to a good positive gain, and we have gained positively for the last four to five years. Through that also, with our member participation and our, and our staff this year, we did achieve our goals, as Al Scott told you. And like Ted McCarty said, we're gratified with those goals, but never satisfied, are we? Well, along with that, we did have a staff meeting in Des Moines, Iowa, last September, this September. At that, we sat there and set forward our new goals that we were going into this next year, and as Al Scott told you yesterday, is a 33%, and they are achievable. 
But we also realized one thing at that staff meeting when we got to looking at the situation, there was a bigger thing facing us, and that was the dollar's tax staring us right in the face, wasn't it? We looked at it and said, what do we got to do? Well, the first thing, the immediate problem we looked at is farmers are saying out here, say, look, this is putting us in a heck of a bind. We haven't got a lot of time. So the immediate thing we have to do is to put more money into the farmers' pockets across the United States. Okay, we realize the problem and what we got to do, now how do we go about it? Well, the base price for all milk across the United States is set in Minnesota and Wisconsin, isn't it? So we've got to raise that price. Well, what do we got to do then to do it? Well, it's a two-fold situation. We've got to raise that price, and we've got to activate the county people to do it. Because the statement's been made, we've been outnumbered 50 to 1 as far as staff is out here in the field. Well, I never did agree with that, because I can look at all the staff sitting right out here in our county structures. So the way to whip both problems at one time, to raise the M&W series price, to put more milk on in Minnesota and Wisconsin, and to activate the counties is let's bring members in from across the United States, and we did. We brought them everywhere from New York, to Washington State and everywhere in between. These people went in there. They met with the hosts of Minnesota and Wisconsin. A lot of them stayed right on the farms with them. They went up and down the road. They enrolled production. They mowed a lot of hay. And I'm glad to say that Minnesota and Wisconsin have bailed a lot of it since they've left, too. What we're going to do, I want you folks to, I want to recognize these people that went into Minnesota and Wisconsin at this meeting. The meeting at 1 o'clock, we'll be talking with the people from Minnesota and Wisconsin that hosted the drive. I'm going to call their names out in threes, and I want them to come forward and talk for about two to three minutes just to let you know what they experienced up there and what they experienced when they got back home. First off, I want to call forward Al Smith, Charlie Peterson, and Ion Klingsbale. Would you come forward, please? of Washington, D.C. <laughs> he told that to the House Committee in his testimony. <laughs> I, can you hear my voice all right? I even got a shock when I touched the mic. You can't touch anything in this hotel without getting a shock, I guess. So. First of all, I'd like to say, well, for those of you who don't know, I'm president of the NFO in New York State. And a very humble one indeed, because I stand up in front of people and I talk about maybe what we've done in New York, which I guess that's part of my job. But I do very little. It's people in New York do it. And we found out how successful people are when they work together and when they love each other. And that's what it's all about. I want to thank the people from Wisconsin and Minnesota who welcomed us. We never expected the reception that we got from them to be as great as it was. And it makes me one proud farm dude here to be a part of an organization that's full of people like that, full of them, all over. Sometimes I think we get a little confused of who we are and where we're going and what our goals are and how we're going to accomplish them. And I'm certain that the solution is just to sit down and talk with each other because we all have the answers. I don't have them, you don't have them, together we do have the answers. I want to mention a little bit, I know we're, they're not giving us too much time here so I'm going to kind of run through here, but there are things that I would like to tell you about. <clears throat> Ted mentioned at the last meeting that I went to Washington when he went to speak about the 50 cent tax. And I want to tell you a little story because I had never flown in an airplane before, but that wasn't bothering me because I'd been in small planes and I was kind of looking forward to flying an airline. But on the way to the Albany Airport in New York, I was very quiet and my wife thought that was kind of unusual because I'm usually, when I'm up on NFO, I keep talking about it and it's the supper table, the breakfast table and out in the barn and up in the silo and out in the fields and I just talk NFO all the time with, with my son who farms with me. We have a 60 cow herd family farm. I have no hired help. My wife Jane and I, she's coming in this afternoon for the simple reason that she didn't want to leave my son alone on the farm because we've got eight or nine heifers that are due to calf this week. That isn't right, is it? She should have come with me. We've got to change things like that, don't we? And we are going to. Uh, 
I did go to Washington. I was asked to go with, when Ted went down, and I went, and Steve Pavich went. And I was scared stiff. And like I said on the way to the airport, my wife says, you're awful quiet. And I says, I'm scared. And she says, of what? And I says, I'm afraid of what I'm going to do down in Washington. That I had no idea what I would say to the people down there. I had nothing prepared. She said, you've never been at a loss for words before. And I said, I am now. And she said, when you get down there, something will come to you. She said, leave it in God's hands. And I'm pretty good at doing that, because that's passing the buck, isn't it? But when we got down there, we went in early in the morning. And first of all, there's 14 men on that subcommittee. And I never saw over seven of them there at one time. And I didn't think I was being very well represented if 14 men didn't have time to listen to my problem. That did not impress me. The second thing that did not impress me was the organizations testifying. Up until about 4 or 5 in the afternoon, and this is from 8.30 in the morning, I didn't hear anybody say that you and I can't afford what's being done to us. I didn't hear any organization testify to the fact that they thought it was unconstitutional to tax food. I heard nobody take the part of the family farmer and by the time I got a chance to go on, I think the words had come to me about what I should say. Just before I went on, they brought out a ring of cheese, and they sat there eating cheese while people were testifying. They weren't even listening. And to get ahead a little bit, we went down and testified to the Senate. I thought the House hearings were bad. When you go down to the Senate, the only one there was the chairman. That's the representation we have in Washington. That did not discourage me, nor did it really surprise me. Because we live in a democracy, folks. This is a government of change. And it was set up intentionally to be a government of change. It would never be rigid. It would be continually changing. Benjamin Franklin was asked after they came out of their meeting when we decided on what government we would have. She, a woman asked him, Mr. Franklin, what sort of a government do we have? And he said, Madam, you have a republic if you can keep it. Because, see, it was set up to change. And where would it go from where it was started? Nobody knew that. And I hope you understand what I'm trying to allude to here, is that you and I have a tremendous opportunity. We have a tremendous obligation as citizens of this country, not just farmers, to change. The forefathers also talked about equal parity. We'd have a free country, as Thomas Jefferson said, as long as the land, as much land as possible, was in the hands of as many of our citizens as possible. We had to control the land, not the aristocracy and not the government. That was very important. It was very elementary. And where have we gone? We have not stayed on parity. We're at 50% of parity in farming. We're carrying a $215 billion debt, which we cannot afford. We can't even pay the interest on it. When they tell us our income this year is going to be somewhere between 18, 19 billion, a 10% interest, that doesn't even pay interest that we owe on our debt. I'm mad about that. I'm disappointed that we as farmers haven't organized, that my family has to work like they do at what they want to do, as hard as they do, and they really don't have to. I'm not telling you people here something you don't already know because you're national farmers. But I think maybe what I'm trying to do is to remind you and myself as well the importance of change. We can change this. We can have equal parity in this country, and when we do, we'll no longer have a $215 billion debt. And more important than that, we will not have a national debt that's straddling this country like it is. It cannot continue. And it's your obligation and my obligation to change that. Nobody else in the society is going to because they've all got a bigger piece of the pie than we do. I 
thank the people from Wisconsin and Minnesota for the reception. We look forward to them coming to New York. And I also mentioned something that I believe I'd like to say something again, a solidarity in this organization, that we're all farmers, we're all interested in the same thing, but there's a piece in the Bible that says something about look up and see. And sometimes I think maybe we're not looking up, we're looking down. Because what we can accomplish in this organization nationwide is just unbelievable. We can turn this whole country around, we can put it back where it was originally intended to be equal parity for business, labor, and farming. We can do that. J we saw just a little bit of it going to Wisconsin and Minnesota where we closed the gap and brought the price of milk up a little bit and that was a very few farmers doing that. Really very few in number. If we all took a little active part and did that we could take the M&W price and we could price milk and it wouldn't take very long to do it. And if we did that, everything else is going to come along with it. We're not taking advantage of what was given to us. Winston Churchill one time said that democracy was the worst form of government in the world, except for all the rest. We're not taking advantage of an opportunity we have here as citizens in this country to effect a change. The representatives in Washington are not going to effect change for us until we tell them we want the change, until we demand the change. That's when it'll happen. See, I talked to congressmen in that back in my state. We have poor representation in farming, very poor. I heard Mr. Gunderson from Wisconsin say that the, the problem in the House there, the biggest opposition came from New York State. That makes me feel real good. But he was right. He was. I, I think I'm probably at a loss for words because what I want to say I think I feel and I can't seem to put it into words to you. Our organization is in an election year this year. And I would ask each and every one of you to look very deep inside of the opportunity of what's happening to our organization that we all love here this week. You and I are very important, very important. Not singularly, but together we are. Change is constantly necessary. I know it's necessary on my farm. It's necessary in my family. I've seen some of my kids leave home that I didn't feel too good about, but I've seen them come back after they have changed and thought about it and took advantage of things in life, and I'm very proud of them. I think we're at that moment here in our organization where we're going to consider do we want a change or do we not want to change? I'm not a politician. I don't think any of you people are out there either. Look at your organization. Discuss things in your organization with people from other states, from across our country. Make decisions here this week that are going to affect you and I and the generations that come after us. And that boy of mine that's home on the farm and my children that are not on the farm, that are out in, in society, who wonder why. Why don't you change things, Dad? Why do you let things go on the way they are? Why don't you have 100% of parity? They can't understand why we don't do this. And I don't either, because I know we can do it, and I know it's awfully easy to do. Thanks to the people of Wisconsin and Minnesota who gave us an opportunity to talk with farmers in other parts of the country. We appreciate that opportunity. God love you all. I'm going to get knocked now too, probably. Huh? <laughs>
Every place you go, like Dow says, we keep getting hit with this stuff. I'm Charlie Peterson from Unadilla, New York, and we go out on the road quite a bit, and there's a couple here that came up in Pennsylvania. When the Chef Cheese thing happened back down there, we all went down and helped them people out and got them going down there a little bit. Well, Frank Getman phoned me up before this Wisconsin deal, and he says to me on the phone early in the morning, he says, how'd you like a paid trip out to Wisconsin? I was wondering what was up his sleeve then. I looked at my wife, because it's only me and a wife that run the farm. We have close to over 100 head. And I was wondering whether she was going to let me go, and she said, well, I'll go. I think she likes to get me out of there once in a while. <laughs> so uh, we came out to Wisconsin, and it's awful hard to go out and try to get a bunch of people together and go out with you on the road you never met before, you're a stranger. And boy, that feeling left the first morning I went out. And the best thing I got out of this thing when I went out there was knowing that the farmers out in Wisconsin is just like us guys back in New York. We're all in trouble. And you talk about five years that you're going to have a plan. I don't have five years left. 